My name is James Wright. I'll be moderating uh, this this uh, talk by uh, Andrush uh, Petu. Did I get that even close? Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty close. Um, and and I'm, I'm obligated to say that this session is sponsored by the uh, International uh, Visegrad Fund, Visegrad Fund. Um, on, Andrus uh, has undertaken a huge um, task in his home country of Hungary uh, for the past few years, and that is taking on the government and everybody else uh, with a new investigative website and, a westiga and creating from scratch an investigative effort after many years of working as a senior editor at uh, Origo, the major uh, news organization there and leaving, uh, yeah, so I, I think it was fair to say in protest after changes that uh, uh, the organization came under pressure from the government and switched and became basically a pro-government or pro house organ. And a lot of people uh, then bailed and a lot of them are now working with um, uh, Direct 36, uh, his current uh, web offering. Um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, uh, uh, Andrush, to explain uh, how and why and uh, whether or not you're crazy for doing this. <laughs> yeah, take it away. Oh, and I should remind uh, everybody in the audience, if you want to comment, there's a Q&A box at the bottom, sort of just off to the right of your screen. Um, type your, your questions in that, and then I'll read them to Anush. Okay? Hit it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, James, and uh, for this introduction. And then, yeah, I will, I will let you all decide whether I'm crazy. If I'm, if I'm crazy, then I'm not alone. I mean, uh, I'm, uh, I'm working on this uh, with a team, a uh, team of great journalists. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for having me here. Uh, uh, I'm sure I'm not alone with this, that, you know, it would be much nicer if you could be in the beautiful city of Prague. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, that's something that we, you know, we cannot do now. And uh, yeah, I, the, the idea behind this session is that I think we, we have to, you know, realize that there is a pretty sad pattern in the, that is happening and that we can see in, in our region and maybe, you know, in uh, uh, other parts of the world as well in the last five, 10 years that you know, uh, there have been uh, uh, political crackdowns on independent uh, media, oligarchs came in and took over or silenced formerly independent uh, outlets. And, uh, you know, I, I would like to tell you the story like what we did when this happened uh, with us. You know, I'm not saying that we have a magic solution or a weapon against these problems, but maybe the, our experience can be useful for others who find themselves in a, in a similar uh, situation. Uh, and uh, yeah, so as uh, James mentioned, I used to work at Origo, which is a, a, a pretty big uh, news website in Hungary. And I spent more than 10 years there. And, uh, you know, it was a pretty good place to do journalism for a long time. You know, we had all the uh, editorial freedom to do, uh, to cover sensitive stories and do investigative reporting. But then things changed after 2010. Uh, that was when uh, Viktor Orban, our current prime minister, uh, came back to power. And he and his party and his government started a pretty uh, systematic, uh, you know, uh, crackdown on uh, independent media. First, they actually, as far as I remember, the very first law that they introduced was about the rewriting the whole legal framework of how media operates or should operate in uh, in Hungary. So that you know that uh, tells you uh, what a big priority uh, it was for them. And then first they went after the the, the state media, the, the supposedly impartial public media in Hungary. They purged, you know, most of the, you know, good and uh, uh, independent journalists from there. And then they, you know, they uh, put their own people in charge. 
uh, and basically they transformed it into a, a, a mouthpiece for the, the, the government. And once they were done with that, that took like, that went relatively quickly, one or two years. Uh, and then they started to go after uh, private media. And uh, uh, it turned out that the, the one of the first uh, targets, uh, and maybe the first big target was Origo, this news website where I uh, worked at uh, at the time. And uh, it, uh, unfortunately, it was a, it proved to be a pretty easy target uh, because they, uh, uh, Origo was owned by a telecommunications company. And now we know that's not a good, that's not a good setup. That's not a good idea. Uh, even though, you know, it seemed the, the owner, you know, it was a subsidiary of Deutsche Telekom, which is, you know, basically the German state. So we thought that they are kind of invincible and they are huge. And nobody would mess with them, but obviously that was not the case. So because telecommunications companies uh, always have, uh, you know, all kinds of links with the government, the government have uh, leverage over them in return. So it's, a, it's not an ideal situation to have a, a, a telecommunications company as an owner if you are in a, a media business. And basically that's what happened. I don't know exactly the, you know, the ch chain of events, but suddenly we, you know, around 2013, early 2014, we, we just felt that we didn't have the freedom anymore. Suddenly we started to feel pressure from our own management uh, inside Origo, the publisher, the CEO, and they, they had strange, strange requests uh, for us. Like they, you know, they wanted us to drop certain stories. They wanted us, you know, wanted to, uh, 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 wanted us to remove uh, articles from the website, even though they were, you know, factually okay. And we, we always said no, we resisted, but then uh, of course, you know, the, the, the tension grew and it became so hot that, uh, you know, it, it, this whole situation exploded. And then, so what happened was that in uh, uh, June, 2014, the editor in chief was forced out of his job and I, uh, I was his deputy. And actually I was working on the story that caused uh, uh, most of the tension. It was a story about a, a powerful government official who spent uh, unusually high amounts of money on on uh, hotel bills and uh, on his trips. What he was doing there. So anyhow, uh, we when the editor in chief was uh, forced to leave, then I and I knew that this was because of political pressure. So I resigned and, and many other people resigned from the newsroom. And then we pretty much the day after, like quite soon, we started to have discussions like, okay, what should we do next if we want to stay in this business? And it was pretty clear to us that uh, even back then, and then, you know, it was like six years ago, the media environment wasn't nearly as bad as it is now in Hungary. Is, uh, you know, the, the, this government crackdown has continued uh, ever since then. Uh, and uh, so we, but even then it was clear to us that if we had gone to work for another uh, commercial uh, media company, then we would have, would have ended up in a similar situation. Uh, and uh, so we, we decided to try to build uh, something from scratch, something, uh, something new. And uh, we decided that we wanted to follow a different model, that we wanted it to be a nonprofit. We wanted it to be uh, community-based and we wanted it to be built on partnerships and networks. Uh, why nonprofit? Because uh, it was pretty clear from that experience at Origo that the political pressure is, is, is very often exercised through you know, through business relationships and through contracts, through advertisements, you know, that's how they can, they can put pressure on a, on a, on a, uh, a business. Uh, that's how they can, you know, uh, blackmail them or, uh, and uh, so if you don't have a, if you don't have an owner, if you don't have a, a, a investors, you know, there are no big financial interests behind us, you know, then we have more independence. 
And uh, why community? Because uh, we also, it was also clear to us that it would be much more sustainable uh, as an, uh, this organization if we, you know, if we were not relying on only on donors, like uh, big foundations. First of all, there were not that many out there. We're doing this kind of, uh, supporting this kind of projects in Hungary. Uh, and uh, and also, you know, if you can rely on, if you can build a community around the organization that also gives you legitimacy. You know, it, these are Hungarian people, Hungarian, you know, local, uh, uh, the local public, then, you know, that gives you uh, a bigger legitimacy. Uh, and uh, why the partnerships? Because the simply we knew that this was going to be a small uh, project, especially at the beginning. And if you are small, then you are more vulnerable. But if you are, if you have partners, you know, if you work with other civil society organizations like lawyers who can help you, if you work with uh, other news organizations and they publish your stories, then you will have a bigger reach. If you are part of international networks like investigative uh, networks like uh, OCCRP, uh, where James uh, works, uh, and uh, or you know ICIJ or GIJM, you know these are all big uh, networks uh, of uh, uh, investigative journalists and uh, and outlets. And then you know through these you will have access to more resources. Uh, so. I'd like to focus a bit more on the on the community part of our project because I think that's 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 a key uh, element. Uh, uh, Andrew, sure. if, if we could make that maybe two minutes and then we will have some questions. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. So yeah, the uh, the so basically what we did when we when we launched uh, Direct Thirty Six when we, we we started to pu uh, publish stories in early two thousand fifteen. Uh, uh, we launched a crowdfunding campaign uh, as well. And uh, uh, we were, it was not, it was not only about asking for money, of course, the money was a, an important part of it. But, you know, we wanted this to be something more like uh, not just, uh, you know, uh, uh, they, they give, they give you, they give you the money or they give us the money and we send a thank you note. We wanted a closer relationship with these, with these people, with these supporters. Uh, or we call them members, uh, supporter members. That the so we 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 this we, we were trying and we were thinking of what we can give in return, and that was the the idea that we uh, came up with. Or actually, it was something that you know we we checked we we looked for international examples as well. That we basically we we we, we gave them insight into our work, and uh, you know they uh, our supporters get. Uh, special newsletters, you know, whenever we publish a story, if we publish it on a Friday morning, then, you know, they will get an exclusive newsletter the day before with a preview of the story and some, you know, background information, how that story was made. Then, you know, we also do uh, live events. Uh, of course, now everything is online uh, where we talk about, you know, our projects or we invite e guests uh, who are experts on the topics that we are covering. Or the, 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 the thing that I like the most uh, that gives you the, the kind of the closest relationship with, the, with your uh, members is that we do workshops uh, normally in our office, but now we do that online. You know, when we, sh when we talk about our methods, we never talk about our sources or, you know, nothing sensitive, but we, you know, we share me uh, our methods on how we do, you know, online research on social media, on databases, how we analyze data, how we interview people, because you know this can be this can be interesting, this can be fun, but it, this can be you know these skills can be useful even for people who are not journalists. So and uh, these are quite popular, and uh, actually you know I, I always enjoy them because the, you you learn a lot from these uh, these uh, these people. So uh, and uh, you can you can build like a kind of like an. Uh, incentive uh, into that system that you know the more you give the you know we are talking about from 10 to 100 euros per year so it's not you know huge amount uh, and so the but the more you give the the more insight you get into our work that's the idea uh, behind it and so now we have 
uh, we ran our uh, the latest campaign was in early uh, early fall, and so now we have around uh, 2,500 members, and uh, you know in the last couple of years uh, we could cover our uh, you know like 70% uh, of our expenditure from the money that is coming from uh, the the members, which is great, and actually the you know the the, 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 it's, it's, it, we also realize that, you know, actually big donors, big foundations are more willing, are happier to, uh, you know, they, uh, to give you money if they see that you have that really big community element and you are a sustainable organization. Excellent. Andrews, we have two questions, both related to something we, we've actually talked about, and that was mm -hmm. the role of the European Union in, in Hungary. Uh, the first question is, now that Hungary has accepted uh, the, in respect to the European Union values, has it changed anything in, this, in your situation? And um, is Hungary following a European hidden agenda um, just to avoid being condemned? And uh, is, it, uh, is it early anything to any sort of compliance? There's a little bit of an interpretation of that question. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I'm not a I'm not an EU EU expert. We don't really you know we don't really report on uh, EU matters. We cover we follow how EU fund uh, EU funds are spent uh, in Hungary, and of course I've been following what's going on in, in, in Brussels uh, uh, surrounding this you know the rule of law uh, mechanism. Well, uh, you know, I mean. Personally or directly, you know, our organization hasn't benefited from the the EU itself. We have. I know that the EU started uh, giving out grants for investigative projects, mainly for cross border uh, projects. We, I think, it's a it's a great idea. We haven't really uh, participated in any of those uh, any of those grants uh, yet, and uh, I mean. I'm I'm on the opinion that you know I think uh, uh, I think Hungarians if they are unhappy with their political system or their political leaders you know I don't think that they should uh, look at uh, Brussels or the EU or Germany you know to fix this uh, you know I think it's uh, Hungarians should you know uh, do something about that if they want to. Uh, having said that, I think that you know the EU could do more for for journalists, but you know in general for transparency. Like I, uh, you know, one of our frustrations is that you know he, you hear a lot of preaching from EU about uh, transparency, and uh, but when we go to the EU institutions and we are asking for records and uh, you know documents, we ha hardly ever get anything. You know, they, they do these, all these inquiries about how EU funds are spent or misspent or abused in Hungary and other countries. And, you know, they, we, we've been asking for those uh, documents and audits. We've never got anything. Not to mention, oh. you know, the, all the problems about how, you know, MEPs are spending our money. So, yeah, I think they should, you know, not only talk the talk, but walk the walk as well. So they really haven't pressured the Orban, the Orban government to do anything different than, than it has been? Uh, no, no, yeah, no. Okay. What advice would you have for others? You've mentioned a few things, but anything overall that uh, if somebody wanted to start their own uh, investigative operation under similar circumstances, the kind of precautions they might take or the kind of opposition they might face, what, what advice would you have for them? Uh, Probably the, you know, the, I think what we did right and uh, that probably it was the smartest thing to do that we, we listened quite a lot, especially before starting our project, spent months talking to people, talking to people who had done uh, similar, you know, created similar organizations or ran similar organization. And, uh, uh, or, or people who had uh, run crowdfunding campaigns uh, before, you know, I'm uh, please no nobody should. Uh, I hope nobody will be offended, but 
you know, the I think uh, sometimes I feel that you know journalists are because maybe they are because they are covering you know so many uh, different areas and uh, you know they have this megaphone and then they they think that they are uh, really smart and uh, maybe yeah they are, we are smart at you know telling stories but you know that's not enough if you want to set up an organization and build an organization so yeah listen to and uh, seek uh, advice. Even like, for example, because the, a lot of what we do when, when you when you launch a project, it's about how you communicate and how you craft a message, especially when you do a campaign. So, you know, we tend to vilify people in the public relations industry. And, you know, sometimes we do that, uh, you know, for the right reasons. But, uh, you know, there are some good people in that industry as well. And if you know some some of those good people, then you should reach out and talk to them. And then, you know, they will, because, you know, they have a different, they are professionals. You know, this is another profession, communicating. It's not, telling stories is part of that, but it's not only that. So, yeah, I think that's, uh, being humble, I think that's a, that's a good advice. And uh, also, I think, you know, I'm, I'm talking about this as I as I mentioned at the beginning. You know, I, I've done this as a as a as part of a team, but I'm not only talking about our team. We have a team of seven people. You know, I had two other co-founder partners. But there are so many, so many people who have helped us. You know, people that we we you know we hadn't even known before. They they when they heard about our project, you know, they approached us and they offered their help. So yeah, it really takes a village to raise an organization. Another question, um, will you be able to prove cases up to the point that the rule of law mechanism now requires? The narrow definition of protecting European values now means a member state can only be excluded from EU funds if there is a clear and proven case of corruption. Will Direct 36 able be able to do that? Uh, well, uh, I'm, what I can what I can say is that we've 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 already done uh, similar things. Like you know, some of our some of our stories uh, have been followed up by EU authorities. Like we've done a lot of reporting on, for example, how a company uh, linked to actually formerly owned by the son-in-law of the Prime Minister Viktor Orbán how they, uh, you know, how there were irregularities in, uh, in how they got uh, EU funded contracts. And then, you know, we reported on that, other outlets reported on that too. And then, you know, sometime later, we, we saw that the OLAF, the anti-fraud uh, body of the EU came to similar conclusions. So, you know, that was kind of like a, a, a Kind of confirmation of our of our work, and you know some of our other stories. I mean, I, I've I've never heard this. You know, officially again, as I mentioned, EU officials don't really talk to us, but you know, I have the impression that they they are aware of our work, they follow our work. We publish our stories in English too, so that makes it easier, I guess. And uh, so we uh, they you know some of our other stories also. You know, resulted in uh, EU inquiries, not necessarily Olaf, but other. You know that the Commission looked into certain uh, projects, certain things that we exposed. So we will continue that work. I don't know. You know, I, of course, we don't know how this whole mechanism will work in practice. Uh, yes, it seems that it will take some time to work it out. Work it out. Looking back at setting up Direct 36, are there things that you found that worked really well and things that maybe didn't work so well and you now wish you hadn't done? Uh, well, yeah, we, I mean, this is pretty, you know, it's a quiet, <coughs> uh, it's a journalistic uh, thing that, you know, when we started, I so, uh, 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 previously, I, I, I did a I did a fellowship program in uh, in the U.S. in the in D.C. and then I spent uh, uh, several months uh, with the investigative unit of the Washington Post, which was obviously a, a great and amazing 
experience. And I, you know, I was very much inspired by what I saw there, when, what, what, I, what I learned there. And so when we launched Direct 36, those, you know, memories were pretty fresh. And I, you know, I had this idea to, to have an organization, an investigative special unit that, you know, that uh, publishes pretty rarely, but then something, you know, big project, very explosive. And then what the, so we, that's what we did sort of in the first year, uh, sort of there were big gaps between our, you know, publications. And then, you know, some of our stories, yeah, they were explosive, some were not. And then we just learned that our audience, our, you know, uh, our supporters didn't really appreciate this kind of model. They wanted, they wanted to see more wanted to hear more from us. And uh, so, yeah, that was a lesson. And that, that's something that we changed uh, after that. And now we publish more frequently and we do more follow-up stories and more like kind of quick strike uh, investigations. I mean, it's, uh, it's also a little bit easier now because we have more staff. How many staff do you have? Uh, we have a team of seven uh, people. I mean, that includes us, the uh, uh, the other co-founder who is still with the organization. And we also work with, uh, you know, uh, we work with uh, uh, graphic uh, designers and uh, yeah, so people in visual arts. So we have those partnerships too. Uh, just a reminder to the audience, the Q&A button at the bottom right hand sort of side of your screen, uh, type in any questions you have. We have about uh, eight minutes left or so. Um, I'm kind of curious, we talked about the economic pressure that Origo faced and it caused it to change its spots. What kind of pressures do you have and do those include any sort of physical danger for your people? Uh, no, I would like to make that very clear that, uh, you know, I think Hungary, as bad as it is, I mean, the, the media environment, uh, it's not, you know, nearly as bad as, you know, we have, you know, far worse uh, places, uh, you know, uh, I mean, we know what's going on in Russia or, you know, other, you know, former Soviet republics, uh, uh, but even, well, I mean, of course, there are there were cases that reminded us that you know you don't have to live in uh, in Russia uh, you know to be in physical danger you know the the murder the assassination of Jan Kuciak a few years ago and his fiance I mean that was that was really a, a shock and you know it's uh, yeah, I think but yeah but I have to say that you know we I, I'm, I don't think that we are in physical danger we we haven't received that kind of threats either. What, what's pretty common, but I think that's common in other countries as well, that you get legal threats from the subjects of your investigation. That's pretty common. But you know, we also have good lawyers. We are really careful in what we publish. So usually those threats remain threats. And then, you know, we, so we, uh, and, but I think the, so the, the, the big, for us, the, the bigger problem is that uh, just how the the environment is changing and how it is harder to uh, uh, get your stories out. And uh, like, you know, three years ago, if you published a good story that was picked up by 10 uh, news websites, three newspapers, to two TV two 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 TV channels, TV stations. Uh, now it's you know it's maybe it's three websites, no newspaper, or maybe one, uh, you know one TV if you are lucky, you know. So that's that's the thing. And then on the other hand, the government has built this really powerful propaganda machine ecosystem, you know, that really functions as a as a political weapon. And uh, so that's hard. And then at the same time, you know, we, when you try with our with, with your limited resources, like what we have, you know, when you try to reach out, like when we we try to do try to organize events uh, in smaller cities in rural areas, and even just finding a venue is is a challenge, is a problem because once they realize who you are, 
then you know it turns out that the place is booked booked forever you know so that's the kind of thing and then even if you manage to find a place you know people don't show up or you know they are afraid or so that's yeah that's really hard Another question from the audience. Is anyone teaching investigative journalism these days at the university level or has it been removed from the curricula? Connected to that, how do you find young journalists to work with you? So I just, uh, you know, I just finished uh, teaching the a semester in my, at my old university uh, course uh, uh, in, in Seged. So yeah, as far as I know, you, there are still you can still uh, study uh, journalism in uh, at the, uh, some of the at least some of the Hungarian uh, universities, and uh, yeah, we you can yeah you can find journalists young journalists through those programs. There are a few good initiatives like uh, there is a mentorship program that we've. Uh, uh, participated in uh, that's been that's been going on for some years now it's it's run by uh, transparency international the local branch here and uh, you know they basically they look for they find they recruit mentors for young journalists and then you work on specific projects or you bring them into your newsroom so uh, yeah but i'm i'm a I mean, I am by the nature. I I'm Hungarian, but I try to be optimistic. You know, we are pretty pessimistic by by nature. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, I'm a little bit uh, worried that our profession, as beautiful as it is, I think journalism is a, is a you know, it's a really, it's a a, a beautiful uh, line of work profession. But you know, it's not necessarily. I think it's it's PR has problems. Uh, you know, we, uh, it's, you know, it's not very appealing. You know, a few years ago, we had, uh, we hired a, a young, really talented uh, journalist who, you know, he left the industry, you know, because, uh, you know, she was looking for something more stable and I couldn't really, you know, I couldn't really blame her. Uh, it's not a, yeah, maybe in that sense, we are crazy. <laughs> It is a crazy life. Is. We have about four minutes left. Any other audience questions, please type them in at the Q&A uh, prompt at the bottom of your screen. Uh, uh, to follow up on something you said a little earlier, um, your stories get picked up in different ways now than, than maybe they have in the past, but uh, how much direct traffic do you get to your website and how much um, is uh, republication elsewhere or publishing with partners? important mm -hmm. to you so the the traffic on our website is uh, is relatively small because we don't we don't publish very frequently so we publish maybe a couple of times a month uh, so you cannot really you know build a huge audience for something like that so we we have partnerships we are our closest partner is a popular news website called uh, 444 and uh, you know we <coughs> uh, uh, it, 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 it really depends on the kind of story that you have or the topic, but, uh, you know, when we, you know, uh, we, we, some of our, you know, more popular stories, you know, we had one about Orban's fight with, uh, uh, with his former ally and oligarch, Lajoshimich, which was a really uh, fascinating story, and, you know, that reached uh, 300,000 uh, people directly. Uh, some, you know, others that we, we this year we did uh, a really a close look at the this uh, mysterious uh, Hungarian-German relationship. And, you know, that was also really popular, like 150,000 people uh, clicked on it. And uh, and that's just a, yeah that's just the primary reach. I mean I I I, I consider the you know our, the reach on our through our partners a, a primary reach. But then we also promote our stories quite uh, 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 you know actively. So we you know we even create we write like uh, shorter summaries of our long form stories so that they will be easily 
uh, you know, it will be e easier to pick, uh, pick up by other uh, news outlets. And then, you know, uh, our stories tend to be uh, quoted and cited uh, quite, quite often. And we, you know, we don't know all the, the figures for those, uh, but, uh, you know, we, we, we track them. Excellent. Well, with that, we've, we've run out of time. Uh, so thank you so much for attending everyone out there in the audience who we can't see and, and to Andrus, um, good luck with it all and, and uh, going forward, be safe. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for again. Here. Thanks. Have a, have a good weekend.